The Christian community in the Middle East has long been under threat, and their numbers are dwindling, particularly in Iraq, the cradle of Christianity. For years, we have covered this much-abused community, and during Easter, it seems the perfect time to turn our attention to the suffering Christians in the Holy Land. What can be done to support these persecuted Christians struggling for survival? Actor and Oscar-winning director Mel Gibson, along with philanthropist Mike Illich, recently organized a charity event called Give to Live in Los Angeles. They wanted to raise awareness and support for the beleaguered Christian community in Lebanon, who get very little media attention and even less support. Here's Mel Gibson explaining what inspired him to become involved. I didn't know much about this, you know, the persecution in the Middle East with Christians, the Chaldean Christians in particular, in Syria, in um, Iraq, flooding into Lebanon, refugees. And, uh, and then I heard voices, and uh, they were the voices of Bishop Kasahi. These are boots on the ground men um, who have witnessed this stuff, they see it, and they they do. They try their hardest to do something about it. But of course, you don't hear about this. It's not on the front page. It's not even on the back page. But it is a severe problem. I uh, I listened to them. They acquainted me with the kinds of things they saw, they witnessed that that are going on. Um, some things I wish I didn't know. Seriously, I wish I didn't know these things. But now, having looked at it and become aware, I I, I can't turn away. And so I was compelled. To, uh, to do something about it. And one of the first people I spoke to was a new acquaintance of mine, uh, a man named Mike Illich. He's a, a tough and astute businessman with a big, soft heart. And he's a man of God. And he, when he heard this uh, about what was going on, the plight of the Christians in the Middle East, he and his uh, wife, Noel, just jumped in with both hands and feet, and they said, let's do something. And, and this is how Give to Live was born. And uh, this is the inaugural. <laughs> this is the inaugural event in what I hope become many, many more. So, you know, we're going to give it away uh, to where it needs to go. You'll hear from an expert panel about the kinds of things uh, that are there. And I hope it doesn't upset you as much as it did me. But in a way, I hope it does because it needs to touch you. I then moderated a panel discussion on the dire condition of these Christian communities in the Middle East and why so many of them are now in Lebanon. I was joined by Nina Shea, director of the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute, former U.S. ambassador at large for religious freedom, Sam Brownback, and author and counsel to the Chaldean Archdiocese of Erbil, Iraq, Stephen Rasha. Nina, I, I want to start with you. In 2000 in Iraq, there were 1.4 million Christians. Today, there are less than 200,000. Why, why is this community, first of all, important? And what happened to these people from the Saddam Hussein reign till today? You know, the, Raymond, this is a critically important community for ev every Christian. This is one of the most ancient Christian churches in the cradle of Christianity. And they are disappearing to the vanishing point on our watch. Um, you gave the statistics. Uh, we heard uh, the priest praying in Aramaic, the language of Jesus of Nazareth, one of the only communities in the world to do that. Uh, they trace their faith to Doubting Thomas, whose relics they harbor, they, um, the, the canon of their, their Eucharistic prayer was developed by St. Jude Thaddeus the Apostle. Um, their monasteries are 1,600 years old. Um, you know, oppression came before through the centuries to these people. But ISIS genocide really stands apart, and it has been recognized as genocide by both administ recent administrations. Um, the survivors of this genocide face a post-apocalyptic state in their homelands. Tell us what's happened to some of the, the men, the elderly, and the women. Yeah. Uh, tell us what's happened yeah. to them. So, since so ISIS um, uh, waged a bloody blitz through Nineveh back in 2014. 
And they started by designating, stamping a red N on the properties of Christians in Mosul, ancient Nineveh, the center of uh, Iraqi Christianity, and for Nazarene, because they were followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, there were no functioning churches, no intact communities, no priests left under the ISIS caliphate. 45 churches were destroyed in Mosul alone. St. Elijah Monastery uh, from uh, 6th century was pulverized into gray dust um, that we saw from satellite pictures by ISIS, demolished. Um, these Christians weren't caught in the middle. They were targeted. ISIS wanted to erase every trace of this uh, ancient civilization, this Christian civilization. Um, they gave an ultimatum to the Christians when they arrived, ISIS, uh, that is. They said, convert, leave, or die. Most fled in a panic. Some died trying. Um, one uh, Iraqi nun, religious sister, told me that 12 of her nuns died in, in the immediate aftermath. But the, uh, those who stayed were the elderly or the disabled. The men were killed. One woman told um, a priest that I spoke to who, who's, uh, who cared for them in the camps um, afterwards that she saw her husband crucified on the front door of their home because he refused to convert. Um, the uh, men were taken away, uh, bound and blindfolded in the back of pickup trucks, never to be seen again. Um, the men were tortured in front of their families or vice versa. Um, women yeah. had a horrific fate. Um, they were taken to slave markets and sold to jihadis as ISIS jihadis as war spoils. Uh, they were a recruiting tool for young jihadi men. Um, you know, I just want to mention quickly, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but I just want to mention uh, two cases. One was little Christina, age three. Uh, she was taken to a slave pen. She was snatched from her mother's lap in uh, 2014. And um, we know about this because Rana, another Christian woman in her 20s, was also at the slave pen and had, um, waiting to be sold, and she had a cell phone and called back to her community and told them about Christina and that she was taking care of her, the three-year-old, until she was given away, the, the three-year-old. Um, Christina, I'm happy to say, was found in the liberation of Mosul three years later. Um, Rita is another woman, and Rana was eventually liberated as well um, with the liberation of Mo Mosul. Rita um, Ayub was in her 30s. She was married to eight men in one night um, with the ISIS sheikh performing the ceremonies. She was eventually sold to a man in Syria, and his wife beat her daily for her to convert, she said, until she was bleeding from the head. She would be beaten until she was bleeding from the head. She was also released by the Syrian Democratic Forces in 2017. Um, you know, Sister Diana, the, um, a, a nun from that I think you've had on your show, Raymond, and um, I think we all know uh, up here, but she is a nun, an Iraqi nun. She said this uprooting has just displaced this community, body and soul. It has stripped them of everything, including their dignity and their humanity. Steve, tell us what happened to the infrastructure of the Chaldean Church in Iraq, and what are, is the state of things in Lebanon today, which is where many of these Christians fled, Syria and Lebanon primarily, and Jordan? Well, um, when, the, when the war came to uh, northern Iraq, the, uh, the international aid community that we all think of as being in place to deal with these things was nowhere to be found. Uh, over uh, nearly 200,000 Christians fled from Mosul and Nineveh. They all fled uh, mostly east, uh, ended up in and around Erbil, which is the, the Kurdish capital uh, in the northern part of Iraq. And there was nobody there to help them, uh, nobody, uh, except for the churches. And it was only through private aid uh, from the churches around the world that came there immediately to help these people, uh, without which there would likely not be a Christian population left 
uh, in northern Iraq to still save today. And so as the church uh, uh, engaged in this initial triage to take care of them, the expectation was that the UN, that the US, that these other institutional aid organizations would come on board, um, and they never did. They never did. Um, the, it was still two, three, four years later before the first trickling amounts of aid directly to the Christians uh, would come in. And, and one of the main reasons that this aid was, was kept from the Christians uh, was because they refused to go into the camps, the UN camps that were run by Muslims because of what had just happened to them. So the church took care of them. They uh, refused to go into the UN camps, and, and then they were stuck in a situation where the governments uh, said, well, we're not going to help you. Uh, if you go into the UN camp, we'll help you, but we're not going to help you. Even though the church was taking care of these uh, refugees at a rate that was, uh, was, was substantially less, than what the UN was paying. Typically, we did that in the church at about 5% overhead on, on dollars, whereas the UN was, was 50% uh, overhead. So we had these, these situations, and then there were families that were from Mosul uh, in the towns around Mosul, and their homes had been completely destroyed, and there was just nothing for them to go back to. Those people fled mostly into the diaspora in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Uh, and that's the situation that we have now. There are over 70,000 uh, Christian refugees, and they don't even qualify for refugee status uh, under the current way that our international aid paradigm works. They're just stateless, homeless people. And they're trapped in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan with no place to go. No place to go and nobody who will take them in. No home to go back to. Ambassador Brownback, speak to me. You've been to the region. You've seen the carnage and the fallout here. First of all, to pick up on what Steve was talking about, where was and is big charity? What happened to USAID, the UN? Uh, I know you labored very hard during the Trump administration to divert some of these funds to the Christians in the Holy Land. What happened there? What, what happened is, is that big government does big. It doesn't do small. Big government uh, replaces power plants. Uh, it can redo a road, but it doesn't do a home. It doesn't start a job. Uh, it, it does big. And it doesn't replace churches because of establishment clause, even though I think there's a clear argument they should do that. But these churches were all desecrated. I went into a church there in the region, just completely mauled the whole thing. And they exhumed a, a priest that had been buried there in the church to desecrate his body. There in the, in the, the church, they actually did. I'm going, what, what kind of mindset does it take to do that? But they did. And this was all about, really, it was like in, putting a, trying to put a spiritual dagger into the heart of Christianity. I mean, there's a lot of spiritual darkness that's with this. And that's what they were doing. And they seek to remove all traces of Christianity, so Christianity cannot be claimed in this area whatsoever. And they're pretty close to getting it done, is the sad part about it. It requires people like you and people in the United States to stand up uh, for them, stand up for them politically, stand up for them and help them financially. I saw a diocese in Phoenix area rebuild a church. They'd made connection with people there and they just helped rebuild the church. Um, and if the United States and people here don't do this, it won't happen. I didn't understand it when I first started looking at this. The role that Christians play in the region they really are a bridge of peace in many, many ways and have maintained that peace over millennia now. Nina, talk about that and how we see the depleting of Christianity from the Middle East and the rising of tensions and violence. Well, um, you know, these Christians are known as uh, modernizers. They brought hospitals and colleges and um, printing presses to the Middle East. Civilization. Uh, they, they are uh, considered um, uh, moderators because they don't have the militias 
uh, they didn't have any protectors or their own militias in Iraq. And um, so they were extremely vulnerable. Um, and then, then the mediators between East and West, they have been a buffer um, between the, the uh, Muslim factions who are, or the Sunnis and the Shiite who are at war with each other. So um, they are peaceful people. They've been very important. And I think it's really um, important to the United States national security. It really shows, I mean, uh, Ambassador, you've been going around saying all the time how there's this overlap between uh, religious freedom, between our ideals and our uh, security needs. And um, that's, I think it's very clear. Religious freedom is the fundamental human right. It was a, it was a right given to us by God. Remember, God had to give us freedom of our own souls to do with whatever we choose. And he knew we would get it wrong, and he'd have to send his son to clean it up even. So, I mean, if you just think about that, this is a huge thing that God gave us. No government has the right to interfere with that. And then we see governments manipulating it all over the place, and it leads to insecurity. Because then, if the Christians can't practice, the ISIS can come in and let's just, let's just slaughter them. So every genocide in the last hundred years, I think except one, has been of a religious minority because religious freedom is not protected. Stephen, tell us why this is so critical to maintain. Because some people might say, oh, well, they're on the run. They can come here. They can go elsewhere. Why is it important to protect this community and continue it? And it's linked to every... Christian in the room and in the world? Well, so the Christianity that's in Iraq is, is a Christianity that was brought to them by the first apostles in the first century. They are amongst the oldest Christians on earth, and uh, the Bible that you read is full of those places and that story. Our faith comes from that original Christianity. The everyday language of the Christians in northern Iraq is Aramaic. Their everyday language, not just their liturgy. Their everyday language is, is in Aramaic. And to give you an idea of what they're faced with, um, uh, you see, pictures are worth a thousand words. So in, in the pictures you see scrolling up there, there's one picture you, you see of a group of young children uh, 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 altar, uh, altar servers, uh, they're, they're in red capes. That's in the town of Batnaya. That's in uh, northern Iraq, just outside of Mosul. And I took that picture in Easter of 2017. That was in a bombed out church. It was the first church that, where they had been able to celebrate back uh, since, uh, since ISIS had taken over that town two years earlier. That town was liberated in November of 2016, and the day after it was liberated, I was in that town with three of the other priests to document it for the church, and we were in the chapel of the Virgin Mary in that church. We found the Virgin Mary statue had been put up and decapitated, but the graffiti on the wall said, oh, you slaves of Christ, there is no place for you in the land of Islam. Either get out or we will kill you. And that was not in Arabic. That was in German. In German. Those were German-speaking ISIS fighters in northern Iraq. So think on that. Think on that and the enormity of the problem that these people face. Ambassador Brownback and, and Nina, I want your take on this. I, I, I want to sort of fast forward to where these Christians have sought safe harbor, which is primarily in Lebanon. Tell us about the dangers and threats that these Christians face in Lebanon. The, the, give us a quick thumbnail of the political situation and how China and Russia and other countries are beginning to take an interest in Lebanon. Lebanon has been a traditional sanctuary for Christians in the Middle East, and as they've suffered attacks from place to place over the centuries, they went to Lebanon to um, have security, and, and including uh, many of the Armenians and those uh, other um, religions from uh, other Christian streams from, from um, uh, Turkey uh, went to Lebanon during that period. 
Um, they, um, Lebanon was a very special place because they were able to, the different sects, Sunni, Shiite, Christian, were able to um, cohabitate peacefully for the most part, and there was a Christian, and there is a Christian leadership in, um, a president in, um, in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, so, you know, it's been very important, and, and, and now it, its economy has completely collapsed. Yeah. Completely. Yeah, and, and the government, for all intents and purposes. Uh, Ambassador, tell us about not only the, the stress these people are under, but the role of Hezbollah, which is an Iranian-backed militia group in Lebanon, and how, the threat that presents to the Christian community. The, the Hezbollah threat is that they threaten the Christian community to get, convert or get out, or we kill you. I mean, and, and it's not put subtly, either. Uh, and it, this is just... This happens, or people get killed. Virtually most, many of the families in the region will know somebody of their family that has been killed. And you know, we, we look at it here and you go, are you sure? And I say, yes, you can go and you can interview virtually anybody. Remember, the deal kind of in the Middle East was, Israel was gonna be the Jewish country, Lebanon was gonna be the Christian country. And then the rest of it would be run by Islam. Uh, now, that'd be, we'd allow Christian populations to be there. Well, that's not happened in Lebanon. Uh, I mean, a lot of the Christians just get run out. And, and there'll, there'll be subtle ways, there'll be not subtle ways, but it, it's become a place that's pretty highly dysfunctional and very difficult. And the people that are here from Lebanon that survive and stay there should be applauded for staying. We really started for the first time to say, no, we're gonna help you stay where your home is. Uh, because you wanna be there and you shouldn't be run out of your own home and we're gonna fight for religious freedom and we're gonna fight for you to be able to stay in your home country and so it doesn't have to be a singular Sunni Muslim nation. And that's the right policy. That's the thing we should do. It just requires us to really stand up and to push for it. Yeah. Steve, you wanted to add. Yeah, it's a great point by the, the ambassador because while we do have this large amount of, of Christians in the diaspora in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, there still is a core group of about 200,000 Christians that are adamant about staying in their homeland. They want to stay there, and what they need in order to stay there is for groups like this to not forget about them. I'll start with Nina and then go to the ambassador and then Steve. Why is an organization, a private group and private charity like this one, preferable to what we've been dealing with and going through the UN or even church-run, God bless them, church-run charities um, in the United States where, tell us what happens. What's the difference? Well, um, if I can start, the... Um during ISIS period, when the caliphate was intact, when, when all the uh, Christians who had survived were out of Nineveh and were in Kurdistan or Lebanon or some other place, the UN didn't aid them. Uh, the, there was not a single camp in the Middle East, and there isn't one today, run for Christians by the UN. Uh, they, they are expected to go to uh, majority Muslim camps that, uh, where they are persecuted again because the, some of these camps, the big ones in, in Jordan, were actually R&R places for jihadis right. Right. Um, where they'd come and go and get some rest. And, and so these, these Christians were threatened there. Um, and, and, and sexually abused. The women and, were sexually, and sexually abused, abused and, and targeted. And, and so forth. And, and, um, they, they didn't go there. They, they went to their bishops and asked for help all over the region. And these bishops were totally unprepared for this kind of aid a project because uh, it, ISIS came in in a flash and um, uh, you know, they didn't expect it. And uh, it, they took over the Christian areas of, of two countries, mm -hmm. Iraq and Syria, right away. Um, and, and, and so, um, you know, the, the UN, uh, the US gave all its aid to the UN. And so the UN decided, we just wrote them a check, and the UN decided where the aid went, and they went to the big Sunni Muslim centers almost as a counterterrorism uh, payment <laughs> rather than the humanitarian aid that it was supposed to be. So we actually paid and incentivized the Christian exodus. Yeah, that's right. Why is a group like this more nimble? Ambassador Brownback, and better disposed to get the aid directly to this community? It just big government does big, as I started out. It'll do a power plant, but it can't hug a person. 
And you don't want government hugging you, let me tell you that just to, at the outset. You don't want that. But I have seen groups like, and you're doing it the right way, you connect with somebody that's there, you got the bishop, this is a reputable person, you connect with them, and then you ask them what are their needs, and then okay, we're gonna come in and we're gonna help you, and, that's, and they're gonna put 100% of the money on the target. Government, if we get less than 50%, if we get close to 50%, really great project, uh, you know, if we can do it that way. Steve, you want to amplify? And look, this is one of the reasons we all took part in this. When Mel first told me about this, my first question was, how much staff do you have? They have no staff. It's all volunteers, and the money's going directly to the people providing the aid, which is a good thing, certainly from my perspective. Steve. Yeah, what you need to understand is that when big aid comes, it comes with conditions. And the conditions that it comes with uh, for, for people of faith, for the Christians in the Middle East, uh, the conditions are you essentially have to stop being Christian. All of those things that you hold dear to, all of those things that make you who you are as a people, as a community, well, we want you to set those aside for all of these social justice priorities that we think are of greater importance. I'm going to give each of you 30 seconds to wrap up. The, the, the lasting thought, the idea, you want everyone to keep in mind as they consider how they can help this important cause in Lebanon. The communities are so small at this point that your help can go a long way, can make a difference. Yeah. Steve. Nina's absolutely right. You can move the needle. This is something you can do right now, today. You can decide to be aware, to pay attention, to support these efforts of, of Mike and Mel as this goes along. It will absolutely make a difference. Ambassador. If, if you don't help, it's not going to get done. There's no other country, no other place that's going to do it. That's why you got to yeah. do it. And your dollar there will go 50 times further than it will go in Southern California. So. <laughs> and then His Excellency Michel Kassarji, the Chaldean Bishop of Beirut, spoke at the Give to Live event. My Chaldean Catholic Church is the Church of the Martyrs. The church here of Mesopotamia, it's a church that has suffered persecution, displacement, and slaughter since the first century of Christianity. Hundreds of thousands of believers, clergy, nuns, were killed because they only believe in Christ as Lord, God, and Savior. A church that has massacred by the hands of the Persian, Muslims, Turks, and ISIS, my country, Lebanon, is going through the most dangerous and delicate stage in his existence. Either we will be in the tormented East, the light and the salt as believer and living witness, or we will migrate by force and be uprooted from our land. My answer is that we want to remain in Lebanon as a free Christian, with our head held high, we do not want to immigrate. So today, I am here with you, ladies and gentlemen. I need your help. Today, I am here to tell you that I don't want to pack my bags and migrate. Today, I want to stay with my people in Lebanon, in the East, the cradle of civilization where Christ has born. If you'd like to help support the persecuted Christian community in the Middle East, visit Give to Live. Click on Give at the top of their page. It's a very worthy cause, and the organization tells us they have no administrative costs. A hundred percent of all donations go directly to support the struggling Christian communities in Lebanon and the Middle East, or you can reach them at that address on the screen.